Dog Works Radio is sponsored by Alaska Dog Works. Check out their website at alaskadogworks.com. Start your day tomorrow with the Daily Dog with Michelle Forto, the morning podcast on Dog Works Radio. Apple podcast reviewer Patty Christensen calls it funny, smart, and filled with all the info I want to know about dogs. I love this show. Wake up with the Daily Dog, available on Dog Works Radio on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your shows. Hello and welcome everybody. This is Robert Forto, the co-host of The Side Vibe. Recently, we transferred our feed over to a new podcast host, and we thought it would be cool to bring over some of the older episodes. On this episode on The Side Vibe, we're talking to Olivia Malakoff. Check it out here. From two beautifully scenic and historic locations, the Hudson Valley, New York, and Willow, Alaska, this is The Side Vibe, brought to you by Dog Works Radio. Your hosts are author, journalist, and photographer, the Five Sides mom, Dorothy Wills Raftery, and Dog Works Radio executive producer, canine behaviorist, trainer, and lead musher of Team Aneke, Robert Forto. The Side Vibe is all about the magnificent breed of the Siberian Husky. From training to grooming and for those who show and breed, from parenting to playing and rescuing Huskies in need, whether mushing over snow-covered trails or lounging on tropical shores, even for Hollywood sides on the big silver screen and so very much more. If it's about a Siberian Husky, we'll chat about it here. Hello and welcome everybody. This is Robert Forto hosting from Willow, Alaska and on the line calling from the Hudson Valley of New York, Dorothy Wills Raftery, otherwise known as the Five Sides Mom. Dorothy, how's it going? Hi, Robert. It's going pretty good here. Um, you know, we're actually today we have a little bit uh, of an overcast day, but we've had some strange weather. Uh, you know, we had a few days of almost 80 degrees, and then all of a sudden we got hit with some snow flurries. So it, it's been a little bit of a strange uh, spring, but other than that, it, it's going pretty good here. How about by you? I see you guys had some snow, too. Yes, it is finally melted. We are in the middle of spring, and all of the spring chores are starting here at the at the Timaneke Kennel, and we're looking forward to planning for next year. That's wonderful. Now, I happen to notice over on your Facebook page um, that you had one of uh, the dogs that you have in training there, Gunner, with um, the owner and handler, Dan, and uh, you were actually training the dog as a service dog. Can you maybe just uh, you know briefly tell us a little bit about that? Yes, we train service dogs here at, in our lead dog service dog program, and Gunner happens to be a German Shepherd, and we're training him for his handler, Dan. Dan is a veteran of uh, the war over in Afghanistan, and he's back now. He has uh, a traumatic brain injury, but gets along pretty good and is doing very well with Gunner, and we're looking forward to his progress, and I think it's going to be a great match. Well, that's excellent. And um, now this is something you do through uh, your training there, and that's what you do when you're off-season from sled dog racing? Yes, at Alaska Dog Works. Wonderful. And and folks can go check that out, too, because you do a lot of great work over there with uh, training and and behavior of dogs. Yes. Um, and, And how is everything else up there going well? Everything is going very good. Looking forward to uh, my daughter going off to college in a couple of months and being an empty nester for the first time in our lives. Oh, that's a huge rite of passage. Um, so, it is. Uh, we'll, we'll be checking in to see how you're doing. I'm sure she's going to do fine, but I think it's always a little bit harder on the parents. <laughs> I think so, not only in uh, the separation, but the pocketbook as well. Yes, well, my my daughter, did, she went to school a little closer to home, so, <laughs> um, but I have heard that, um, but uh, it, it'll be interesting. It'll be nice to hear what's going on with her as well. Now, yes. I know this morning um, we've been having some technical issues. I know my, my cable here is down, um, but fortunately, you know, it, it won't hold up the show. And I just wanted to check in. What, is our guest today, was she able to get in? Yes, Olivia yes, is on the line. Olivia, can oh. you hear us? I can. Okay, wonderful. 
Wonderful. So then, uh, Robert, you know, April's uh, a very busy month. Um, it's the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Month, where each year the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, or as most of us know at the ASPCA, um, which is a national leader in anti-cruelty initiatives and animal sheltering, urges supporters across the country to go orange for animals, to join them in raising awareness. April 8th was also National Dog Fighting Awareness Day, and the ASPCA partnered up with professional WWE wrestling champion A.J. Lee in her fight against animal cruelty and dog fighting in the uh, Get Tough campaign, and that's hashtag Get Tough. You may have seen many social media and blog posts of late with um, that hashtag, and that's where folks, including us here at the Five Sides, joined in this very important campaign worldwide. Um, any of our listeners can go check out my April 8th uh, blog post over at fivesibes.blogspot.com, and you can read more about that and you know check out our five sibes with their get tough um, posters and signs. Um, it is a, st- a staggering statistic, but according to the ASPCA, uh, quote, an animal is abused every 60 seconds, unquote, and that abuse includes um, dogs involved in dog fights. According to the ASPCA.org, dog fighting occurs in every part of the country and in every type of community. The ASPCA is working to ensure that canines are safe from this cruel sport. Their responders save animals from abuse and build cases against abusers, and at the end of every case, their placement specialists ensure that the animal abuse survivors find loving homes. In the last five years alone, the ASPCA has reportedly assisted on over 100 dog fighting cases and have come to the rescue of more than 2,100 dogs. Through their Get Tough campaign and through the support of other pet lovers sharing selfies of their pets and themselves with the Get Tough signs and stickers, which we'll tell listeners during the show how they can request these items, uh, in the hope that they can get the word out to protect dogs from this type of abuse. <clears throat> Excuse me. While dogs used for dog fighting are typically uh, the pit bulls, with other breeds, huskies included, are often used as bait dogs. Over the past several years, we have read frightening news stories, um, you know, about these type of things, and uh, you know, we've heard different um, you know stories about what goes on. So we're going to talk about that today, and uh, you know, and, and we're also going to talk about how the social media um, really works on helping spread this news. Now, a little about the ASPCA. They strongly support community coalitions that are committed to reducing the number of cats and dogs in that community who are at risk of becoming lost, abandoned, or relinquished to shelters. Toward that end, the ASPCA uh, supports efforts to maximize accessible and affordable spay-neuter services. They practice TNR, which is a trap-neuter return program of feral cats, promote the adoption of homeless animals, and educate potential guardians on pet selection, the use of microchips and visual um, <coughs> visible ID tags, and they provide ongoing expert training and behavior assistance to guardians so they may live successfully with their companion animals. Today, we're going to be talking with Olivia Melikov, who is the Senior Manager of Social Media with the ASPCA on the Media and Communications team. In her role, she is responsible for developing social media campaigns to raise awareness and educate the public about key animal welfare issues like dog fighting, puppy mills, and the importance of adoption. Many of the online programs she works on also have an action component in which the social media audience is asked to take an action to improve the lives of animals, whether that by contacting their local legislators later, or helping to find forever homes for a special needs animal. She's also worked to launch the ASPCA's first interactive mobile app, which helps pet owners be more prepared in the event of a disaster and teaches them how to search for a pet if they go missing. Prior to the ASPCA, Olivia was a social and digital media strategist at Hunter Public Relations, where she helped develop a successful social media pre- practice for the agency, and launched a successful social marketing programs for consumer and lifestyle brands. Olivia currently lives in Brooklyn with her pet bull, Carmela, who was a failed foster dog. Um, on this show, we're going to be discussing how the ASPCA is working to end dog fighting and the ways in which folks can join in their Get Tough program on, on, on their Get Tough on Dog Fighting initiative. We're also going to be discussing what to do if you see an animal being abused and how to protect your own pets from being abducted and possibly being used as fighting and or bait dogs, and as well as, as I said, the important role social media plays in supporting the welfare of these animals. Olivia, welcome to the Side Vibe. Thank you so much for having me. Now, Olivia, um, you know, to begin with, I know um, many communities here, even 
we have here a local SPCA, and that's a Society for Prevention of Animals. Um, and it's a local shelter that is actually different from the ASPCA, which is a national nonprofit organization. And I know some people think that SPCAs are chapters of the ASPCA, while others say there is no connection at all. Could you maybe just clarify the relationship um, or the difference between the two? Sure, uh, no problem. So the ASPCA is actually not affiliated with local SPCAs. Um, that's a common misconception. We're not an umbrella organization, but we do work with tons of local shelters and rescue groups around the country, SPCAs, humane societies, you know, what have you. Um, and we work with them by providing boots on the ground support toward helping to increase their adoption numbers and keep animals out of the shelter. Um, we provide uh, grants to shelters and, and nonprofits around the country. We help with um, disaster response and large-scale cruelty cases like dog fighting. So um, do work with tons of shelters. We're just not, uh, they're not officially, you know, a part of our organization. Now, April 8th marked the second National Dog Fighting Awareness Day. Can you tell us how that came about and um, who the pro wrestler or how the pro wrestler um, AJ is involved? Sure. We created a National Dog Fighting Awareness Day uh, to increase awareness about the fact that dog fighting is so prevalent and pervasive in our country and, you know, get, uh, get the public involved. And, you know, the more that the public knows that it's an issue, the more likely um, the government will pay attention and uh, the change will happen. Um, the reason we uh, so AJ Lee, she's a huge animal lover, and she actually grew up with dog fighting rescue, so she's very passionate about the issue. And um, we thought that she'd be a perfect kind of ambassador for this initiative. Um, so we reached out, and she was so happy to come on board to help us get the word out about um, how the general public can hashtag get tough on dog fighting. Now, how important is public and celebrity support in this fight? It's it's hugely important because, um, I mean, on the celebrity side, of course, celebrities have that level of influence. You know, a lot of them have millions of followers on their social channels. So to get the public and celebrities to join in and, and raise awareness, we really feel like it can move the needle on, um, you know, eventually getting to the place where we can end dog fighting. Now, why is social media such an important tool in this? And I, I know, like, you know, you know, well, many of us, of course, you know, we retweet things and share things on Facebook. But in the big scheme of things, how how important of a tool is it? Well, it's such an important tool because it's a really efficient way to reach a large number of people and not just in a way where they hear, you know, about the issue, but in a way that they can join in and, and kind of like take a more active role in the issue. And, you know, with this campaign, you know, we created a hashtag campaign and this kind of – um with the hopes of it going viral and, and and in that way reaching as large a number of people as we can. So not just, you know, the folks that we're generally engaging with on a daily basis on our social channels, but even beyond that. And, um, you know, in terms of the aspect of the campaign, which I'll get more into, we're, you know, we're encouraging folks to take a selfie with our Get Tough on Dog Fighting sign to make it more personal. And with this selfie component, it really helped the awareness spread far and wide because, as we all know, people on social media kind of, you know, they love taking photos of themselves <laughs> and being involved in the issues. So right. having the selfie element really um, brought it to the next level. And we also thought that social media, you know, we've, we, we've seen it be a really effective tool in reaching um, and, and making change on the, on the policy front. So this campaign has a legislative call to action, which we're encouraging the public to contact the Department of Justice and actually get tougher on dog fighting as well. Now, what breeds are used in dog fighting? Uh, so the predominant breeds used in dog fighting, as most, most people probably know, are pit bulls. Um, but there's other breeds that are used as well, like the Dogo Argentino, Toso Uno, and Presa Canario. Um, and then there's other breeds and mixes that might be used as day dogs. Um, that would train the dog fighting dogs. Now, I know, um, you know, we've read and heard different stories on our end about how Siberian Huskies and Malamutes are also among the breeds used as bait dogs, um, as are many breeds. Uh, how how do they go about getting these dogs? Are they is it through abduction, through buying from a backyard breeder, a breeder, the puppy mills, internet, all of the above? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I mean, the, yeah, um, first I will mention we didn't have we haven't had cases. The directly involved um, 
Siberian Huskies and Alamies, but they are certainly in as just as much risk as any other breed of being used as bait dogs. Well, that's um, good news. Of, <laughs> I mean, the first yeah. part of that is good news to hear that. Yeah, because you know, sometimes, you know, and, and with social media, too, sometimes we hear one or two stories and then, you know, we don't know how far reaching it is. So it is good to hear that, um, you know, while we do hear of a few, um, that these two breeds aren't, you know, consistently used. But again, across the board, there are so many who are. Um, so, you know, I'm sorry, go ahead. I wanted you to finish that. Oh, yeah, no worries. Um, and so, on, on, you know, in terms of your question about how dog fighters go about getting bait dogs, they... You know, dog fighters really play on convenience and being as low-key as possible to draw as little attention to themselves. So, you know, they'll, if they're a free-roaming dog, they might get those um, ads on Craigslist for free to a good home um, animals. They, they'll, they'll, uh, they might use that. Um, they, uh, they, they've they been known to steal dogs from people's yards or, um, or, or even, you know, go to local shelters and adopt. Now, what steps can pet owners take to protect their own dogs from being abducted? To protect their dogs from being abducted, um, pet owners should definitely keep their animals secured in their yard, um, in, in their home. Always, always make sure their pets are microchipped, wearing a collar with both um, a phone number and the animal's name on it. And um, if anyone suspects that something is happening in their neighborhood and dogs are being targeted, then the police should be contacted right away. And, I mean, microchipping, of course, we all are very, you know, advocates of microchipping. Um, you know, and then you might have some people say, well, you know, if the dogs are abducted, what's the chance that they'll get, um, my, what the chance that, you know, some, they'll be able to get run through a microchip identifier. But, again, these dogs can escape or someone can help rescue them. So how important is that microchipping? Micro, we, we always say microchipping is important just in general in terms of any way that pets can, can go missing, um, you know, whether they're abducted or, you know, if they, if they get spooked by some sort of sound and run away. So we, we always um, tell all pet owners to microchip their pets. And even more important than microchipping is ID tags and collars. The, you know, first of all, that marks that the animal, you know, has an owner. Um, so, you know, it, um, for the general public or anyone who sees this animal, you know, the moment they see that they have a, a collar with an ID tag, it, you know, the whole process of having the animal ending up at a shelter or whatnot would be would be skipped because they could contact you right away if they see the animal. So we just, you know, always recommend microchipping and, and ID tagging as the best practice for all right. dogs. Yeah, I mean, I know so many times you know, we hear the stories of reunions, and sometimes they can happen a couple months later, sometimes several mm-hmm. years later, all yeah. thanks to um, microchipping. So it's really such a, uh, you know, a really good idea for folks to do that. Robert, mm-hmm. are you there? I wanted to ask you a question. Yes, I am. Um, as far as dog fighting in your area, I mean, do you have do you have anything like that going on up there that you're aware of, or anything that you know? is happening up in there in Alaska? Because I know sometimes, I mean, you know, if there's stray dogs or, you know, it's a very large sled dog haven. So I was just curious as to, you know, how it is in that area. You know, I have not heard of any dog fighting cases up here in Alaska. More than anything, we have um, uh, problems with folks that are unable to keep keep multiple dogs in terms of financial resources or whatever so they get uh um failure to provide care and that sort of thing but i haven't heard of any uh dog fighting cases up here all right that's another positive that's another positive thing for those of you who are just tuning in this is the side vibe on dog works radio and we're chatting with olivia melikoff from an aspca about their work on helping animals and their april Hashtag Get Tough on Dog Fighting Awareness Campaign. You can also read my blog article and see photos of my five sides sporting their Get Tough signs over on our blog at fivesides.blogspot.com. To learn more about the ASPCA, including the Get Tough campaign, please visit their website at www.aspca.org slash get tough if you want to check out that program or just their website um, so that you can actually, you know, see a lot of different information they have there and a lot of places that you can surf around on their web page. You can also follow them on their ASPCA Facebook page as well as on Twitter and Instagram with uh, at ASPCA. 
Um, Olivia, there are three ways in which people can join the Get Tough campaign, from what I understand, and that's one, get the toolkit, two, take action, and three, learn more. Can you tell us more about the toolkit, maybe take a few minutes on each one, and just let us know uh, you know, what it is and, and how does this help the campaign? Absolutely. Uh, so our, our digital toolkit available, which you mentioned, at acca.org slash get tough, is a, a digital package that advocates uh, and the public can download to help promote the campaign and basically use their social media channels to raise awareness about the issue. Uh, and in the toolkit, um, you'll find our Get Tough on Dog Fighting sign, which is, you know, can be printed out. There's Facebook and Twitter cover photos and and, uh, profile photos that they can use. And there's also um, digital shareable cards that can be shared on their social media walls. And in addition to, you know, these shareable cards that people can post to help raise awareness, we're also encouraging folks to take a picture of themselves which and, they, and they're certainly encouraged to include their pet in the photo as well, holding up the Get Tough on Dog Fighting sign and post that to their social media channels using the Get Tough hashtag. Um, so you can visit acc.org, like I said, uh, slash Get Tough to download the digital toolkit. And is it open-ended, or how long do folks have to share their um, pet and their selfies for the Get Tough? Well, Dog Fighting Awareness Day was April 8th, so we're promoting this campaign throughout the month of April and beyond. So there's really no specific end um, for the campaign. So we're encouraging folks to do it whenever they like. Um, you know, it's an issue that, that's something that, you know, happens 365 days a year. So um, there's really no no bad time to post. Now, um, the step two on take action, um, uh, how um, who should they contact so that their voices can be heard? I know we we talk about it on a on a bigger, more uh, legislative level. Um, mm-hmm. So how how can their voices be heard, and um, how much of a difference does that make? Well, so step two of the Get Tough web page is take action from a legislative level, and in order the way that we've set this up is so that folks can actually write a letter to the Department of Justice and urge them to prosecute, uh, to get tough, get tougher on dog fighters. And basically this means prosecuting dog fighters with a higher frequency and with harsher sentences. And, you know, we're asking um, the public to fill in their information to send this letter to the Department of Justice. It's very easy to do. And we'll be delivering in the next few months uh, the full signature file to the Department of Justice to encourage them to crack down um, more on dog fighting. And step three is learn more. So where can listeners go to get more information? Well, we encourage advocates to educate themselves on the issue, which is obviously incredibly important. Um, it, they can do this at ASPCA.org slash dogfighting. For more, and here you can find information from everything from our recent dogfighting raids and rescues, facts about pet bull cruelty in general, um, breed specific legislation, and and then what they can do if they suspect dog fighting is happening in their neighborhood. Now, what should the public do if they suspect dog fighting activities are occurring in their area? Do you have some suggestions for that? Definitely. Well, I have to say that many of these investigations that we've done were a result of the tip from the public. So, you know, we're always encouraging people, if they see something, say something. And, you know, this is a huge, huge part of cracking down on the dog fighters. So if, if you do see something um, suspicious in your area that suggests dog fighting might be occurring, we're, we encourage everyone to contact their local police and their an- local animal welfare organizations. Um, make sure that if, you know, whatever... Um, you know, suspicion you have that you write down as much information as you can so that you can get all this information to the local law enforcement. So everything, including the date, the time that you noticed something was wrong, the exact address, and specifically what led you to believe there was dog fighting taking place. You can even capture photos um, to, you know, include in the report that you submit that would be helpful as well. Now, many of us bloggers have joined in the Get Tough campaign and have written and shared posts on social media, joined in blog hops to help spread the word. How else can folks help educate others in the community? 
Well, one of the ways is what we've talked about is to visit ACCA.org slash get tough and take the three steps to help end dog fighting that we've gone through, you know, post on their social channels, visit um, or contact the Department of Justice and learn more. Um, so the more people that spread awareness about the issue, the more people will find out and the more likely changes to happen. Um, many celebrities and government officials have spoken out as part of the campaign, which is really exciting and you know, especially, you know, and, and local shelters, too. So we've had um, tons of local shelters get involved, lots of celebrities, Rachel Ray, Catherine Heigl, a bunch of the Jersey Shore cast. We've had senators like Chuck Schumer get involved. So, um, you know, the more people that get involved and spread awareness, um, the more likely, you know, the the, um, the changes to occur. Now, can you tell us about your personal experience with volunteering with dog fighting rescues? Absolutely. So our um, company, uh, one of our presidents, uh, our current president came on, Matt Bershatker, he created this new policy where employees were encouraged to volunteer in other departments of the organization to kind of learn how they work. And me being a person, you know, who works in social media, my job is a lot of it behind the computer. And I was really interested to see, you know, like the boots on the ground work that we do and, and personally get involved in that. So I, there was an opportunity to help out with uh, a dog fighting case that we had had. Um, it was actually back last summer in summer of 2014. We had all these dogs be seized from a five-state multi-ring dog fighting case, and there are um, dogs in our temporary shelter that we were caring for while the criminal side, um, while, while there was the, a tr- criminal trial was occurring, you know, to pr- persecute the dog fighters. So in the meantime, we had to take care of these dogs. We couldn't place them at the time because until the, the criminal case is resolved, the dogs are evidence, basically. So we just have to take care of them. So I had the opportunity to go and volunteer for a week. And honestly, it was I would say it's like the most amazing and rewarding experience of my entire life. It was it was actually life changing. Um, my role was daily care, so I helped with everything from feeding to cleaning the dogs' cages, helping them with their daily manners, and a lot of um, moving them back and forth between exercise tents so that they get some exercise and playtime and things like that. And just I mean, getting to bond with the dogs and just seeing. You know, after everything they've been through, just like how sweet they were and resilient and how much, you know, how loving they were, it was just, um, I mean, it was just unforgettable. And, you know, the bonds that I built with the dogs, um, I, you know, remember for, forever. And also the responders on the ground, you know, were just such heroes and just people that I could really look up to because it's not an easy job. It's physically incredibly demanding. It's difficult emotionally. And these people, the responders, you know, they – you know, get deployed for, like, weeks or months at a time, and, you know, it's round-the-clock work. So, um, you know, it was really humbling to be around them and, and to, you know, meet such inspirational people. And it's just in general, like, all the love and compassion that surfaced out of something so awful was just a really beautiful thing for me to see. It's it's incredible to me. I mean, number one, I just think that, you know, anyone who works in this field is just amazing, uh, you know, helping the animals. And, you know, we always say kudos to them for, for all the hard work that they do on behalf of the animals. And, you know, you were saying, too, before about how, you know, how amazing these dogs are and, you know, coming from the situations that they did and how loving they still can be. And, you know, to me that's always amazing when you hear how these dogs respond after something that they've been through that's, you know, been so horrendous. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, so many we have so many amazing examples of happy tales, tales, T A I L S, but happy tales of dogs who you know came from these horrible circumstances and are now living in loving homes and they're like spoiled rotten and they have they have their families with little kids and you know you know there's so many you know opportunities for these dogs to get rehabilitated and and get placed. They're incredible alone themselves, you know, and it's just, uh, it makes it all worth it, doesn't it, when when these happy tales, um, you know, when you get to see that part of it. Yeah, absolutely. I uh, I follow a lot of, we, we, we oftentimes will place these dogs with our response partners and they find their homes. So, you know, on social, I always use social media to, like, check in on some of the dogs that I had worked with. And I'm like, oh, my God, I see pictures of them in their homes and they're wearing, like, adorable little sweaters and they're sleeping with like a three-year-old boy and they're just like you know the the big pit bull smile across their face and it just makes me so happy 
Oh, that is so great. Now, tell us a little about Team ASPCA, such as the birthday, wedding, ambassador, and the rock star campaigns. Um, If you can tell us a little bit about those and Mm -hmm. how folks can join in with those. Definitely. So we found um, a way to make fundraising more personal and kind of a collective effort. We've created this tool, uh, teamaspca.org, where uh, the public can actually create campaigns in honor of their birthdays or their wedding, maybe special occasions or, you know, celebrate a special animal in their lives. And they would, what they can do is use the website to dedicate these milestone moments to raise money for animals in need and help us, you know, um, do more on the ground to help animals. Um, so, you know, people can create their own fundraisers. They get a kit that allows them, you know, to send out special emails and, and give away prizes and things like that. And there's a little thermometer that kind of uh, shows you how far you've gotten in your fundraising goals. Um, one, you know, so in addition to dedicating to special, these special, special occasions, Teenage PCA also incorporates the um, National Endurance Program in which people can run, you know, through marathons or, ha- you know, full marathons, half marathons, you know, bike tours to help raise money for the ASPCA. Um, so that's another thing that people can do on teamaspca.org. So I'm I'm a little curious about the rock star because I, I think my huskies are rock stars, and I think all of us think our dogs are rock stars. So what exactly would that be? Um, the rock stars program is basically, you know, um, what kind of like what we coined the term for the folks that raise money for animals using, you know, by, whether it's dedicating their birthdays, dedicating their, um, you know, wedding. Um, sometimes it's like a, a memorial for an animal that has passed away. So, you know, we, we, we applaud these people for being rock stars to help animals. That's amazing. That's really great. Now, for anyone who's just tuning in, this is the Side Vibe on Dog Works Radio, and we're chatting with Olivia Melikoff from the ASPCA about their work on helping animals and their April hashtag Get Tough on Dog Fighting Awareness campaign. You can also read my blog article and see photos of the Five Sides sporting their Get Tough signs uh, over on our blog at fivesides.blogspot.com. Just look for the April 8th post. Um, and to learn more about the ASPCA, including the Get Tough campaign, you can visit their website at www.aspca.org, and you can also follow them on their Facebook page, ASPCA, as well as on Twitter and Instagram, at ASPCA. Now, um, Olivia, you worked on the launch of the ASPCA's mobile app, and can you kind of tell us a bit about the app, what it does, and how folks can download it? Sure. So we launched our first interactive mobile app back in June uh, of last summer. And basically the app is a really vital resource for pet owners to keep their pets safe. And it provides a a variety of different tools to help you keep your pets safe. So one of them is a missing pets tool that if your pet were to go missing, it actually tells you how to search for your pet tailored to your specific circumstance. So, you know, where do you live, what your animal's behavior is like, and and provide you with a personalized checklist of how to search. You can also store vital pet records and vaccination history and medical details about your pet in the app um, so that in the event that you need to access those really quickly, you don't have to dig through a whole list of papers and whatnot. You can just store it in one very easy, convenient place. And then finally, um, if a natural disaster were to occur, our app provides you with information on what to do before, during, and after a disaster with your pet, um, and it uh, will send you alerts if there's a disaster in your area as well. And it's um, it's available for free on both the apps, uh, Google, um, the iTunes App Store and on Google Play. And if you want to download it, you can just visit aspca.org slash mobile app, and you can just click to download depending on if you have an iPhone or an Android. Um, I have an iPhone. I have it downloaded. I think it's a terrific app. I really do. Oh, thank um, you. So. Now, um, what other ways is social media being used to help animals? Well, we use social media to help animals in so many different ways. Uh, one of the examples, which you briefly mentioned, was um, basically using social media to help animals get adopted. And, um, you know, in, in our adoption center in New York City, we do – for, uh, we do a feature called Pet of the Week where we'll post a special dog or cat of that week and um, really we'll create like a digital shareable card for them and, and a hashtag and we really try to use our social media channels to help get them adopted. And oftentimes we'll, 
we'll pick an animal that's a longer-term resident or has some special needs, maybe a senior pet that really could use the extra boost. And we do this, too, for um, – we work with tons of shelters around the country, so we'll help push out adoptables from our lo- from local shelters that we work with as well. Um, another way that social media can be used to help animals, which we talked about a little bit, is on the legislative front. So mm-hmm. really we found that as an advocacy tool, social media has been so powerful in allowing the c- citizens to contact their li- local legislators to help pass better laws for animals, whether that be the passage of a puppy mill bill, you know, you know, we've been talking about dog fighting and stronger punishment in that regard. Um, also, even you know, to help with farm animals and, and you know, improve farm animal welfare as well. So we um, are constantly using our social media channels to allow people to contact whether it's their local state representative or um, council council people or more at the federal level too. That's really where it has to change. Really has to happen, isn't mm-hmm. it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's, now, I mean, there's state issues and, and uh, federal issues, and we, we kind of work to tackle both of them. And, you know, there's different tools to do both, to, to um, contact, you know, both, to make change both at the state level and the federal level. Now, Robert, we're getting actually ready to wrap up, and I just wanted to know, is there anything that you'd like to ask Olivia, you know, about their campaign, about the ASPCA, about Get Tough? Yes, actually I do. Uh, Olivia, thanks for joining us today. Uh, I have a couple of questions in regards to social media and how folks can best utilize it. Um, mm-hmm. e- even if you aren't um, necessarily dealing with the ASPCA, but say your dog is lost, and mm-hmm. as we all know that uh, Facebook and Twitter are becoming remarkable tools in, in mm-hmm. helping us find our dogs, what would be some tips for just the average person to to uh, start a social media awareness uh, if their dog is lost or if something is happening, what should they do? Should they just post a picture and say, help me find Max, or should there be a little mm-hmm. bit more of a deliberate approach? Yeah, um, there's actually um, – there there is uh, some really great best practices of how to use social media if your animal does go missing. Actually, um, I mentioned our mobile app and the Missing Pets tool, and there's a very, very detailed – um, instructions for how to use social media to search for your pet if they go missing in the app. But I can I can go through some of them. Um, one of them is you know creating a, a digital um, shareable card that you can share in your social media channels to try to um, spread the word far and wide. Encourage all your friends to share share it too. Um, and there's best practices of how the shareable card should look. So. You know, and, and what information you put on it. There should be a really clear picture of the animal. The, the word missing pet should be very, in very large and clear font. It should have your contact info and just some very, very top-line information about, like, anything that can make your pet distinguishable. And actually the app has a tool where you can build a digital shareable card using the app and share it right from the app. So that's a really that's really helpful. Um, another thing that I found uh, we've seen to be really helpful: a lot of locations have their own missing pet Facebook pages that oftentimes citizens have started. So, you know, there's New York City lost pets. If you look, you'll find Facebook pages. And um, what you can do is you can actually reach out to different Facebook page admins. See, you know, see what resources there are in your area for lost and found pets. Reach out to the admins of those pages and see if they'd be willing to share that shareable card on their Facebook page to, um, you know, to just spread the word far and wide. We've also seen people start their own Facebook pages for their lost pets, so that's also something that you can consider doing. And not just social media. You can use your email. um, You know, use all the tools at your disposal to get the word out. You know, post flyers around your neighborhood, signs, and so on. Now, I just wanted to um, ask just, for our listeners, when you say card, basically that is um, doing a mini flyer that people would be able to uh, share on the social media. Is that right? Right. Basically, it's, um, yeah, it's like a digital shareable. So, it's, you know, with with Facebook and Instagram, um, the, the, the best size for sharing a photo is like a square shape that is same in length and width. So um, you can – so we recommend creating a square uh, digital um, – card that has all the key information about your lost pet as well as a very clear photo of them. So that's what I mean when I say the digital shareable. 
Okay, great. And then also, I just had a, an, an additional question, then I'll give it back over to Robert. Um, but I am, you know, I've heard, I've seen, and, and uh, you know, a lot of these digital cards or flyers come across that post reward. And then I've heard some people say rewards not actually a suggested thing to put on posters because you might attract the wrong people and not really the people that would help. Is, is there any um, correct? way of or recommendation as far as people stating reward or not putting a reward on a on a poster for say a lost pet sure um we we do recommend um you know we, we kind of there's an option in the app where you can select reward offered or reward not offered we generally recommend if there is a reward to just write reward offered and not include the monetary amount um mm-hmm. i we have worked um really closely with our experts in missing pets to develop, um, you know, the, uh, the the step-by-step instructions of how to search, and that was um, one of the things that they had recommended. So they could probably speak to it in a little bit more detail than I can in terms of the exact reason for that um, of their experts in that area. But from, you know, from what we recommend, I know that we, we kind of – I don't believe we have any – there's any downside to putting it on. We kind of leave it up to the folks to check re- whether they want to um, – call out a reward or not call out. A okay, great. But if they do, it's probably just say reward, and then that way they can do the rest once they actually talk to the people and find out the information. Type exactly, of thing. exactly. Okay, Robert, back to you. Just one final question. Olivia, since you are involved every day with social media in in uh, working with, with your client, uh, the ASPCA, what do you think the future is? What do you think is going to come down the pike? What are some ideas that uh, people are talking about in order to suit, use social media more effectively? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I wish I wish I could predict what the future is going to be, but, um, you know, I've um, – Social media is constantly changing, and it's you know it's so interesting to see how it develops because you know sometimes there'll be a, a brand new tool that comes out and everyone is talking about it, and um, they're like, is this going to be the next Facebook? And, and you never can really tell until something you know develops further. Um, I mean, one one platform that's been growing uh, really really at a fast rate lately is um, Snapchat. Um, it's a it's a platform that started being more popular with kind of like the younger side of like teenagers, and it's starting to become more and more pervasive. And and um, you know this concept of taking a photo or doing a video and then have, and sharing it and then having it kind of disappear after that. So that's growing. Um, I was recently at the South by Southwest Interactive Conference, which is the largest innovation and technology conference. And there's always some really interesting um, things that come out of South by Southwest that are kind of like, what's the next big thing going to be? And the, the breakout app at South by Southwest this year was called Meerkat which is a digital live streaming app, and it's an app that allows you to live stream what's happening in that moment from your phone and it posts to your Twitter page. That was kind of a big hot topic there. But um, I think that, you know, social media is only going to grow and get more and more pervasive. Um, You know, over half the country is on Facebook. It has, you know, over billions of users. Other channels are growing at fast rates. People have cell phones, smartphones before they have computers in many cases. So I think it's only going to continue to grow and be in popularity. And and um, and and as it grows in more popularity, it'll be you know used more and more as a tool to help animals and you know create social change in general. I think what's so great, too, and I know, Robert, we've talked about this a lot, too, and, and Olivia, you just hit on when you said the cell phones, um, because everything is right at our fingertips, too, I think it's just a huge advantage for dogs, whether they've just become lost or they've become found, um, because it's no longer like people have to come home from work, then you go on your computer and you check in. It's instant. So then it's also being shared instantly, so it's getting out there that much quicker, which is just a huge advantage to, I think, you know, locating either the dog or the family. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, mobile technology, that's, you know, the reason that we wanted to create our mobile app is because more and more people are accessing um, you know, whether it's social media or any website from their mobile device on the go. And that just gives for so many more opportunities in terms of, like, geolocation and, and real-time, um, you know, real-time action. So as you mentioned, like, you know, if you, you can, 
you know, a, a, you know, with the touch of your fingers on your phone while you're on the subway or something, you know, send out an alert, post a message on social media, and, and get the word out there just that much faster um, than you would have, you know, if you didn't have that at your fingertips. Right, right. I mean, it's, it's it's definitely, these are the definite pros to the technology, you know, to, to and it helps these animals twice as fast um, as we've ever been. I'm sure it's not even twice, it's probably much higher than that, than we've ever been able to before. Um, so there's such great, you know, positive points about the social media. And I know when Robert and I first started the show, we, we were, you know, talking about that, um, you know, because I had just started my page a few, you know, a few years. And, you know, you started off as kind of... Um, a community networking type thing, and it has grown to so much more. And, you know, we, we get to really share a lot of good information. We get to really help rescues and share their information, the ASPCA information, lost dogs, and it just really is a, a really great tool that really helps, I think, yeah. the animals yeah. in general. Absolutely. I love I love also um, just, like, encouraging people to help their local shelters using their social media channels. So, you know, if you're mm-hmm. interested in volunteering at your local shelter, one way, one really great way to volunteer is by helping them to take pictures of animals. You can even do it on your phone. You can take high-resolution photos now with most smartphones and helping them kind of um, – get the word out about their adoptables using social media, especially if you have, you know, an expertise there, if you're, you know, just have a, you know, a, a, you know, you're just enjoying using social media and kind of know how it works. It's a really great way to help your local shelter. Yeah, that's a great, great suggestion. Now, Olivia, if you could get out one crucial message to the public, what would it be? One crucial message I wanted to get out, which, a lot of people don't know is that dog fighting is so pervasive. It, you know, there are stereotypes about, oh, dog fighting will only happen in this type of community and only these types of people will do it. But the fact is, is that people from all walks of life participate in dog fighting. And that means the lawyers and doctors and it, it can happen anywhere in any community. So I just would encourage everyone to keep um, their eyes open and, if, if they ever see something or hear something that they might be suspecting could be related to dog fighting, then to contact their local law enforcement. The more people that are keeping their eye out and, and taking action, the, the, the faster, you know, we'll get to a place where we'll, we'll phase out this, you know, horrible and barbaric sport. Right. So basically you see something, please say something. Um, yeah. You yeah. know, and, and hopefully one day these animals will not have have this. But, you know, I mean, the efforts of the ASPCA and all the volunteers and, and everyone who um, advocates for it, it's a wonderful thing. And, um, you know, I just really want to thank you for joining us today on this episode of the Side Vibe. And, you know, for the sake of dogs everywhere, um, let's everyone do their part to uh, get tough. And uh, please visit the ASPCA website at ASPCA.org today to see how you can join in the effort and help be the voice for animals in need. Olivia, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Robert? Yes. Thank you, Dorothy. Uh, anything else you want to mention? How about next month's show? Uh, next month's show, we're going to be uh, talking to Donna Kilmedis, and she is from the Husky Tales Facebook page. And I think probably mostly anyone with Siberian Huskies is probably quite familiar with the page. They have um, a lot going on over there. It's a fantastic Facebook page. They do a lot of networking, a lot of sharing of Siberian Husky photos. They do a lot of videos using a lot of um, follower photos, and it's just a really fun fun and informative page. So we're going to be talking to her all about that and, and her Husky tribe. So it should be a really good good show, too. Do you have a date for that yet, Dorothy? I believe we are looking at the last Sunday of the month, but I'd have to double-check that, and I'll be putting that out on, on the Facebook page and stuff, too. But I, I believe it's the last Sunday. Great. Well, thank you guys very much for joining us today here on the Side Vibe. On behalf of our guest and our co-host today, Dorothy Wills Rafter, we will talk to you guys next time. Goodbye. Did you know that Alaska Dog Works trains service dogs for those in need throughout North America? Each and every service dog that is trained through the Lead Dog Service Dog Program and Michelle Forda and her team has an individual training plan. We train for autistic, mobility, psychiatric, and PTSD for our soldiers for service work. If you know of someone that may need a service dog, please take a moment and check out Alaska Dog Works on social media and at alaskadogworks.com. If you like our podcast, there are a few things you can do. You can take a couple of minutes and go to Apple Podcasts and leave us a five-star review. 
You can also check out all of our DogWorks Radio sponsors and promotions in our show notes. Another thing you can do is go over to Facebook, like our Facebook page, and one last thing, please tell all of your friends by spreading the word about DogWorks Radio. Thank you so much for listening to us. We really appreciate you. DogWorks Radio is produced by Robert Forto. Logo art by Angry Squirrel Studios. DogWorks Radio is produced in conjunction with KVRF 89.7 in Palmer, Alaska. For dog training advice, you can contact Alaska DogWorks at 907-841-1686 or visit their website at alaskadogworks.com. If you have a show idea or would like to be a guest, please contact us by sending an email to live at dogworksradio.com.